We are back. The crypto market is absolutely ripping today. We got Bitcoin right around 50,000. Meanwhile, tech is starting to lag a little bit. Maybe some concerns out there around inflation this week. We'll be discussing all of that and much more today on Money Never Sleeps. It's good to be back with you, everybody. Before we get going today, do us a favor. Hit that like button. Subscribe to our channel. Nothing that Kevin or I say is financial advice, clearly. So please do your own research before making any buys or sells. Kev had a great time up in the mountains. I brought the bull run for crypto back with me. I was hanging out up there, snowboarding for a few days. I was like, you know what? Let's make the market pump a bit. So here we are. Once again, your buddy, Jim Kramer. You, know, you Jim, and Peter Schiff. Three guys, three bears walk into a bar. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> so is on an absolute ripper at the moment. ETH over 2,600. Alts are starting to find their footing. Solana at 110. AVAX at 40. Link at 20. Uh, it's a beautiful time if you've been holding crypto. How are you feeling about the current state of the markets? And on the you know TradFi side, we saw a move up earlier in the day. It's starting to come back down. The VIX is pumping. Tech is starting to pull back. A lot happening with political news, with things happening around the world. We got inflation data. We got more about the elections in England. Like so much is going on, like up in Canada. There's so much happening right now. I can't keep up with all of it, but I know that you're doing your best to. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say right off the bat, you didn't do shit to bring this bull market back. This 100% is, is our Super Bowl Joe with the fucking red laser eyes saying it was all part of the, the plan. Uh, that was that was wild. Let's let's just be honest. There. That was a freaky. Was that week. for Bitcoin or was that for the Kansas City Chiefs? I I I was assuming it was for the Chiefs. But it was definitely for the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, and because that whole controversy, you, you, we don't have to get into it. But uh, the whole thing that I'm seeing with the market right now with uh, Bitcoin is it's really interesting seeing the price go up, right? And I think this is where a lot of people make the big mistake of yeah, I'm holding a ton of Bitcoin. I'm holding a ton of crypto right now. Why 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 should I sell? The price is going up. And it's kind of like that uh, that fool's hand of like, you know, hey, we're back. Everything's great. No one's can, no one's saying anything's wrong. Everything's up. So obviously the, the economy, you know, consumers are safe right now. There's definitely tons of money going out. I question that. I, I definitely have some issues with that. It'll be interesting to see some of the CPI data this week. And you mentioned a lot of the political stuff, and I, I keep bringing up Joe Biden and stuff like that. I think the narrative definitely is shifting for what we get in 2024 when it comes to elections. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the CPI data from now on either gets revised to be what it truly is, or it's just not as great as maybe the markets are hoping. So tomorrow's going to be a really interesting thing. That's just one theory. But uh, I'm not sold on anything. And main reason I think I'm not sold on anything is because I think you fuck yourself over when you change your strategy, even if it's this close to the top. I think it's where a lot of bears capitulate and they realize, uh, oh, shit, you know, maybe I was right. I just had the timing wrong, right? So looking at this market and everything, there's a lot more that we can get into, but uh, not sold on it. So still bearish and uh, fucking proud to be holding cash still. Yeah, I was telling you before we started recording how much I've missed out on from selling my NVIDIA shares uh, like a week and a half ago, which, you know, you have to have some sort of strategy for taking profits. Like, otherwise, what are you doing? Like, you're holding shares. You can like you can we can get into like what you can do with shares and stuff, but at some point, you got to take profits and you got to live your life and you got to enjoy that. So it's like, I'm a big believer in DCAing in and DCAing out. I didn't sell all of my NVIDIA shares. I sold about half. Smart. And like, you know, I made a really nice profit on those. And maybe I, I personally think we're going to see another stock split here pretty soon. I wouldn't be shocked at all if it came. Uh, it was announced during earnings next Wednesday, just historically looking at where the price is compared to what kind of, you know, when they've split in the past and what the moves were leading up to that. So I'll look to either buy back more shares lower because I do think we're going to see a bit of a retracement here. It's just flying, too, you know, we got Icarus going on. NVIDIA is just flying way too close to the sun. But yeah, I think having a strategy for entering the market and exiting the market, at least to an extent, not completely exiting in my opinion, is a good thing to do. And so 
you know, I, I'm excited that crypto is pumping right now because I do have crypto holdings. At the same time, I'm just patiently waiting because I'm earning 6% on my cash uh, on the side and just kind of hoping that we see a little bit of a pullback. And if we don't, so be it. Uh, I think that would be foolish to think that we're not going to retest a lower number at some point. Um, but, I, you know, everyone's wanting to take victory laps right now. The bears are capitulating. We have so many things on the horizon that could lead to, you know, the political unrest, uncertainty there. And we can get into like, you know, cash on hand for everybody. And where's all this money coming from? That's going to keep driving the numbers up. Uh, I know you want to discuss that. I know you want to get into what's happening in Asia. So you tell me what is next on the agenda for you. Before we get into that, just two, three things that really quick that you said that were very smart. One, talking about people getting extremely bullish. But don't forget, a lot of people are going to be retiring soon, and you got their stocks and their 401ks and everything at all-time highs. If that goes poof, you might want to have a backup plan. That's all I'm saying, right? I think you should always have a backup plan, especially if you're getting close to that retirement age. The other thing is you said about the money on hand. Money, the, the equity market is not the economy. And, you know, I could pull up the Joe Biden tweet where he talks about Trump saying the same thing. And then next thing you know, it's like the economy is strong because the stock market's up. It's like, well, didn't you just say the opposite like a year ago? Um, it, it's funny to see that because the constriction of credit and how much is being issued is part of the reason why it's hard to believe the market will go up forever, right? You need to see new cash flowing in because then people have the money to spend it. People aren't spending money. We, we got the consumer credit data last week. It was supposed to be around $15 billion, I believe, and the previous month was $22.9 billion, and it came in at $1.6 billion. So a huge miss in terms of consumer credit. shows you that things are slowing down. We need to continue to see debt being issued. We're not seeing that. So that's kind of the issue that we're seeing. And then you just brought up Asia, which is really important because Asia is doing something crazy right now. Happy Lunar New Year to everyone also because they're celebrating that over there. There is uh, The markets are closed. And again, I have nothing against Asia or anything like that. Um, you know, I talk a lot about them, like it's going down forever. I'm just showing you guys what I'm seeing. But I'm seeing this out of Asia. This is from, I believe, Thursday or so. This is an article from the Wall Street Journal saying that the PBOC report doesn't signal the heavy rate cuts markets want. And again, I think a lot of people, when they're saying markets want, they're talking about investors, as in you and me, retail, not necessarily anyone else, because I think a lot of institutions understand what comes with rate cuts. And that's part of the reason why the PBOC probably doesn't want to do rate cuts, right? The main reason that they're saying is that they won't is because they are they believe that inflation slash deflation will get under control and they expect the stock market route to be resolved in the coming year. Okay, I understand that. However, we also saw that the United States' main uh, importer is now Mexico. It is no longer importing goods from China. So that, how does that affect, you know, how the Chinese economy is going to be continue, continuing to do, right? They're not getting these orders from the United States. Then obviously these factories aren't going to be able to do well. They're probably going to lay people off. And what does that do to crude oil if people, if manufacturing companies don't require any of it? Well, that's probably going to send the price of oil down. That's how demand works back and forth within the entire economy. Problem is the PBOC is probably destroying the hopes of any type of recovery in China by not cutting these rates. They have to get money flowing into the into the economy. And I know they're injecting stimulus, but they have to kind of get they kind of have to rip this band-aid off. And it might be a bad year, two years or so before anything does get better. But this would allow China to regrow. The issue is that by doing doing these rate cuts is probably going to drop the equity market in China down significantly. We're not too far from 2008, right? We're below 2020 uh, lows from COVID. You know, the reopening didn't work out as much as well as they had hoped. Now we're starting to see this slowdown. And again, a lot of China's slowdown does stem from a lot of other, you know, global economies that are having issues. Germany, I believe, is having its seventh month of contraction in terms of growth. So that's it's obviously not good, <laughs> you know, uh, and then these all these central bankers are just refusing to cut rates. It's got to be either Germany or China that's going to be the first one to cut. I don't think it's going to be the United States. I think the, Jerome Powell's already told you that he's not going to cut rates in March. Probably not going to see it till maybe May, even June possibly, right? So it's going to be interesting to see what happens out of here. But Asia... As the markets are closed, I it's hard for me to believe that they aren't having these conversations about potentially doing rate cuts, even though this is what they're saying to the public. I think that they're saying, okay, how does the markets reopen when the when the exchanges open again? And that could be, you know, I think that's February 19th or something like that. And if it's not good, what are we going to do, right? Because we are injecting liquidity, we're selling off U.S. treasuries, we're inflating the yuan, and we can't do that because that's just going to put 
everything in even worse place. And then they have inflation and deflation at the same time, deflation of price of goods while inflation of just money supply. That's just going to absolutely tank them even worse. So I have a funny feeling they're definitely taking this time while the markets are closed to go over their options and see what's the best route forward. I don't necessarily believe that uh, that article one bit saying that they aren't going to cut rates. I think that's just kind of a last resort for them, but I think it's definitely on the table. All right, let's do a little bit of a look ahead to this week as far as what kind of reporting we're going to be getting. Tomorrow is going to be CPI, core CPI, all that good stuff. A lot of Fed speakers are talking this week. We've had a few already today, more on Thursday uh, and Wednesday as well as Friday. On Thursday, we get a whole bunch of data around import prices, retail sales, jobless claims. And then Friday, we get producer price index, some housing data. And that's really going to be it uh, for the next couple of weeks. You know, next week, it's going to be a holiday week early. We're not going to get a whole bunch of data there. We got a while until the next Fed meeting. So this is going to be the last meaningful data for a few weeks. And the markets are going to respond accordingly. So I'm curious with that, the big one is going to be tomorrow's CPI data. That is what's going to be catching a lot of people's attention. Are we finally seeing a consistent, you know, if it's, if it's flat still, I mean, we can't take rate hikes back off the table. Like we've seen the, you know, we've seen wages come in strong. We've seen unemployment to continue to be strong. And if the Fed is truthful, which they have been over the last, you know, 18, 24 months about how they're going to proceed, we can't take the idea of rate increases back off the table. And the markets have not priced in like they've the markets haven't even considered that as a possibility, you know, as we look ahead to the March meeting is currently 85% chance of no rate hike and a 15% chance of a cut. So you gotta, you gotta believe Powell to some extent and what he's been saying, what the other fed governors have been and fed presidents have been saying. So that is going to be a really interesting one tomorrow. Like I think we do need to see meaningful movement downward for them to actually consider a cut. Otherwise, they have to bring a rate hike back up on the table. Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, there's that orchestrated chaos if that's the case. Right. If they do have to bring up another rate hike, we saw how the banking crisis spiraled out of control last year because of the rate hikes. You know, that was the reason why. And, you know, if rates are the same price, uh, same level or even higher to a point where, you know, all those liquidity facilities are gone, it's like. Where is this money going to be coming from in the in the system, right? That's so that that's almost like shooting yourself in the foot and just kind of hoping uh, everything works out, but you know it's not. Just hoping that it works out maybe after your term. But uh, I don't I don't see if I think they have to see meaningful you know push down in uh, consumer prices and year over year as well, right? Um, you know the fact that it's kind of been somewhat in a sticky area right here where it just won't come down fast enough. And Powell is, seems like he refuses to budge on that 2%, uh, you know, target. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I honestly think we're in deflationary period right now, but I, I don't necessarily think that there's any solution here to save whatever comes after they cut. Right. Uh, the, the big concern is that something happens before they cut and that forces them to cut. I think that's the worst case scenario. If uh, they, see the inflation numbers come down and then they cut and then the market decides to see some type of correction, then obviously that's a little bit more typical, but you see the markets go before a cut because something in the system breaks. I think that's going to be a race for them down to zero by the end of the year. That's, that's the main concern that I think I have with that, but uh, tomorrow is going to be very interesting. And also the revisions too, from the pr prior months, that's going to be really important to see uh, where we really stand right now with inflation. All right. Where, where else do we want to go? Uh, you know, there's earnings this week. We're coming near the end of this earnings cycle. Uh, so we have a few big ones next week. Like I said, we get NVIDIA, but the the biggest movers have already come and gone. Let's look. <laughs> I know you want to talk about the, the what's going Arm. on with ARM. You mean, so you mean SoftBank? The I'm not going to say it because, again, allegedly, according to me, uh, this this doesn't pass the fucking smell test. But um, you see oh, this here. Is They're earning Oh, yes, it does. It smells worse than stinks. Uh, I don't even know what that meant. Uh, $77 where it was trading uh, before earnings. Then you saw the nice gap up. It went all the way up to 126 the next day. You know, traded down here around one, you know, the 110s around there this morning. Goes all the way up to 163, currently trading at 145. It's up 26.47%. Again, I reiterate this every time. 
90% of these shares are held by SoftBank, the same SoftBank that pretty much ate shit on the collapse of WeWork. And there's also a stock unlock. So shares are going to be unlocked come March 12th, which is the day after the bank term funding program. We do know that SoftBank is in considerably a huge amount of financial trouble right now because of everything that happened with WeWork. We know that if we add up their assets and liabilities, the numbers don't add up to a profitable company. I'm just going to say that right there. I think that there's a good chance that this could fall probably after March 12th once those uh, shares are unlocked. I don't know who's pumping this into fucking oblivion before then, but I think we still have some time where this mania could absolutely play out. I don't think it's going to fall today or tomorrow, but I do think when it does go, it's going to go because there's probably going to be a huge level of distribution, people just unloading on the market. So seeing this at 145 right here, this is very atypical of an IPO, right? Obviously, the IPO is you get a really good push to the upside, and then you get the dump before you see uh, any type of considerable move to the upside. And let me pull this up on the monthly so we can see it. You know, this is what the monthly chart looks like. This is very atypical in my opinion. Usually this is the first candle and then everything else following it is downwards. So this is very ass backwards when I look at ARMS, how their IPO is. You know, we got another IPO in uh, in a few weeks with uh, Reddit. Let's see how that one goes. Again, another tech company right at the all-time highs. Here we go with these IPOs. But this does not pa pass the smell test one bit. And I think this is also doing extremely well because of NVIDIA. Obviously, NVIDIA has been on a tear lately. Just take a look at NVIDIA real quick. If it pulls up, there we go. Yeah, I mean, and I got to zoom out for NVIDIA every time, and I got to remove some of this. But on the right side, we can see all the gaps that are formed to the downside. I'm going to remove this 497. That doesn't matter. Here's this one. But there's a lot of gaps, right? You got one here, one here. The big one, obviously, down here between 363 and roughly about 318. Then we got one around 2, 211, 220. And then we got the big one at 152. When I say big one, I mean that's big. At, according to me, I think that if there is a bubble, that's likely where the price ends up going to it's that 152 level obviously worst case scenario but uh you know there's a lot of things that are really interesting here um you know we talk about cisco being a very similar stock in terms of what happened in the dot-com bubble recently cisco also announced they're laying off i think 10,000 employees so i think again that has nothing to do with nvidia itself but i'm saying that if you're looking at nvidia and you want to look at the cisco stock or say even the micro strategy you know let's pull up micro strategy even for this there's a lot of stocks right now that are just gapping up like crazy and they haven't found no back test of support whatsoever, right? This is micro strategy in the past few days. You know, it was trading roughly around 438 to start the year, you know, right around January 24th. Shot all the way up today to one uh to 724, 725. So there's a lot of things that are just gapping up going crazy in the in tech and also in the equity markets, primarily tech, right? There's a lot that's going on here. It's really questionable whether this is sustainable. Obviously, the Nasdaq's pulling back because a lot of these tech stocks are pulling back today, except for well, NVIDIA right now up $4 and Meta up 3 bucks or something like that. The interesting ones for me, though, across the board is the Russell. Russell's actually climbing back up here. Now, the question is, are we going to put in a new high for the Russell? And if the answer is yes, does it go... Um, or is it does it go higher than I believe right here? This two twenty one oh nine. If it goes above that, then our whole Elliott Wave Theory ABC corrective pattern is a bit thrown out the window. We have to see how that plays out. But if we look at this on the stochastic side, so you can see on the daily, the Russell is getting close to overbought. If we look at this on the three day, man, the internet's slow today. You know, there's still plenty of room to the upside. You know, we have to count these waves, whether it's five waves here. If we have one more push to the upside, it's gonna be interesting to see where that goes, but Small caps have definitely been rallying here, and I question whether they're going to continue to rally, right? they This is definitely a huge level of resistance in this area that we've seen in the past, you know, back in August 22, February 23, July of 23, December of 2023, and then here we are back above in February 2024. There's only so many times you can find uh, resistance before you break above it and it becomes support, but at the same time, there's only so many times you can hit your head on resistance before it becomes true resistance and you have to go find support somewhere else, right? So seeing everything going across the board, the Russell obviously nowhere near all-time highs as opposed to NVIDIA and a lot of these other stocks are just rallying to all-time highs like crazy. It seems like the AI narrative is just the strong bet right now in the equity market. And you know some of these other stocks are being a little bit laggard or seeing a little bit of money flow into them. But I do think that it's a very dangerous game to say that the AI and semiconductor kind of uh, narrative is going to be enough to pull some of these smaller caps out of whatever they're in, right? Um, I, I don't think a lot of people are investing in the banks. The banks are up today, but 
I don't see a lot of people investing in banks because of how much there's been, uh, you know, deposit flight. We're not seeing a lot of people dump their money into other sectors, utilities and stuff like that. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Again, we have OPEX this week. That's going to be also impacting a lot of things. But after this, I think the important thing to be looking at is obviously crypto, which you said that you brought in to 50K I, as you arrived I, here today. Yeah, I did it. I, me coming back from my trip brought the bull market back. Uh, Bitcoin is, you know, hit 50K. It's at its highest level since December 28th of 2021. Uh, and I did that. <laughs> what happened in December of 2021? Just kidding, guys. Just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> we don't need to get in. You know, that was down. This is up. There we go. See? I'm very, I'm very concerned about a few things with Bitcoin, right? Obviously, I'm as not, a I don't want to, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I, I'm oh, I was going to say, I was going to say, as a bear, there's some things that uh, could definitely seem bullish, right? Look at the weekly stochastic RSI. There's plenty of room to the upside here. I'm just saying that that's something you have to keep in mind. I still believe that we're in an ABC structure, right? Each uh, wave has taken about a year. So right here to FTX, that's one year. That's five waves down from FTX to where we are currently. That's a little bit over a year. That's uh, waved the B wave. And then I expect our C wave to bring us just a little bit lower because I don't think we're going to go up above the origin. I don't think we're going to go above 68K or so. Um, you know, I'm sorry. Sorry, I have to say that. I, I still believe that we're going to see sub 10K Bitcoin in a wick. I think it's going to probably settle around 14K, though. I think that's the key level. So you'll probably see a lot of closes around there. Uh, like it or not, that's just what I fucking see. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, not sorry. But is what it is. And I look at this. It's, it's really easy to say it's not going to because obviously it's like, Bitcoin can't drop 50% from here, right? Uh, just take a look at this. It can't. That was 77%, just an A wave, right? And then obviously, you know, people who are bearish down here, including myself, said it couldn't rally. Well, it did rally 224%, right? Now, what's to stop us from seeing 80% from here? There's a lot of stuff that's, that won't stop us. I'm, I can guarantee you that. That could definitely bring us down there around 80%. So we're going to have to watch and monitor how this plays out on the macro. The way we say yes, or I is just kind of fishy right here. If this starts to close, like shoot up really rapidly, then it tells me that, okay, there's probably a lot less momentum to the upside and a lot more to the downside. Bitcoin's in a really weird place, right? The fact that look how many days it's been green. It's just been rallying straight up. I, saw, I talked with House last week on the show about how I didn't trust this structure one bit. Uh, mainly because of this right here, right? And I'm looking at this, it's supposed to be a corrective wave. And what we got is, you know, A, B, C, which I was expecting, but it didn't it wasn't deep enough for a B wave. So I didn't buy into that. What it looks like is some type of weird, irregular pattern that we're starting where it's a five wave to the upside here. I think we're going to see a bit of a pullback and we could see a little bit push up higher. And we'll take a look at the liquidation and where everything's sitting. I think we could go to about 51, 51 and a half. That's possibly where we're going to, maybe end this and there's a few reasons to why we could see that let me just share my screen real quick uh crypto capo a lot of you guys know him gets a lot of shit for being bearish been bearish this whole time very similar to i he has um he, he shared his wyckoff distribution schematic and the reason i don't like to bring this up is because sometimes it's hit or miss right we you only see this usually at the top or the bottom of the market and we've seen only v recoveries v-shaped recoveries to the upside it's not sustainable and when we see something like this, where we, you know, I think where we see that up thrust right there in the middle, uh, right here, that was where we hit for the ETF news, and we got this mate, this uh, sign of weakness, right? We had this push to the downside to about 37, 38k, and then look at this rapid move to the upside here. This is no different than what we're seeing right now. So we're probably going to see 51 and a half or so. I think we're going to go above 50k. We already did, but I mean, just a little bit more, and that would also line up with. Uh, uh, wave four pullback really small maybe to this line right up here where the up thrust was and then we get a push up to the absolute high and i think that's going to cause a lot of people to go max long there and then that's when we start to see this kind of fall apart right i think that's going to be the in the insane distribution phase that we are seeing just the the climb was too rapid how fast we move in the past few days to get to where we are and that's probably a sign that okay there's people that needed to offload we know that grayscale celsius and a bunch of these other institutions definitely want to offload some of this bitcoin I don't necessarily think a lot of people believe that this market go up forever. And especially smart people with a lot of money don't think that. And they also want to take profit because they don't want to be holding a bag of, you know, whatever it might be going up this high if they can secure a little bit of profits and cut, uh, you know, declare, declare some profits on the ride up. Now, the last thing I want to show you is the Bitcoin liquidation chart slash funding rates. 
So I kept saying 51 and a half. Well, when we look at the Bitcoin seven day, we can see that the red line is right here. You can see that down here, there's only about $784 million going up to 55 million. Uh, we can see that there is a lot of liquidations, easy money that they can potentially- 55,000. 55 million. That's oh, where million. Bitcoin's going. The moon. No, yeah. you're right. You're right. 100%, man. 55,000. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, 55,000 right here, you know, 51, 51 and a half seems like that's where some of these liquidations start to die off where it doesn't make a lot of sense. And this is just on the seven day. I mean, it can pull up the 30 day too. see how far it goes back, you know, down to 41 K it's uh seven billion dollars or so of liquidations where up here, it's only, like I said, just a 51 and a half, it's 350 million or so. So it makes a lot of sense to wipe that out. A lot of people go max long and then you can kind of just ride that down. That could be the top of this B wave that we're waiting to end. I thought it was over when the ETF came out. I think we're very close to the top of that wave. And then we're going to start seeing the five wave move down or, or, or keep going. And then we max and we liquidate all of those shorts. And that just keeps sending it higher. Whose money are we using? I don't know. Exactly. That's, that's like, oh, you know, the kids are, it's I'm like, not, oh, listen, I don't, I don't tell people what to do with their money. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be out here trying to, you know, predict the future, but I'm just saying maybe there's a short squeeze. It's like the kid who's asking his single mom, mom, can we get McDonald's? She's like, you got McDonald's money? It's like, hey, hey, Bitcoin, Satoshi, can we get a, you know, 70K Bitcoin? Whose money are we using? It's the same exact scenario. So I think a lot, it's kind of the mentality a lot of people do have though. Like I'm not even being mean or anything like that. I, I just think a lot of people think it's going to go up forever and that there's just infinite money. And then if they cut rates, they're going to print money. Well, it's, they're not going to print money for you. Let's put it that way. They're going to be saving it. So some of these banks and their friends and institutions don't go under. Uh, let's look at the liquidations that we got today. And this is where it's really interesting too, right? We got about $200 million worth of liquidations in the past 24 hours. It's good. It's a good number. I'm not, I'm not upset with that one bit. However, that's not necessarily the amount of liquidations that we see when uh, when we see liquidations that are at big at grand scale, right? Uh, you know, we talk about FTX. FTX was an insane level of liqu uh, liquidity that was wiped from the market. The Evergrande dump that actually happened back in August, you know, everyone was saying it was Elon Musk that dumped the market. It was obviously what happened in China with Evergrande. Uh, that sent us close to about, I think, $390 billion or so. So obviously a bigger dump than what we're seeing here on the pump to the upside. So I think that the liquidity to the upside is definitely getting uh, – is getting a little bit shitty. I think a lot of people are capitulating to that point and it's just causing the perfect setup for a lot of people to go max long. And the reason I say max long, because people are capitulating. Whoa, look at that. Look at all that red, right? There's red across the board on all these funding rates. A lot of people are going max long into this right here. There's a good chance that, you know, this changes in the next few days, right? I, I think there could be even more red across the board for alts as alts might see a little bit of a pump to the upside. But I do think that this is definitely getting to the point where, you know, we talked about it right before, I think we talked about it right before the ETF, right before the ETF went live when everyone was going max long. We said that there's a good chance that the, there could be a pullback because the funding rates were just too nasty, right? It was too big of a gap between positive and negative. Well, it's getting close to that right now. Um, you know, I don't think we're there quite yet. I think there's a little bit of push to the upside, but you can definitely see the sentiment in the space. A lot of people are going leveraged max long on these exchanges. It's a little bit dangerous, uh, especially when you're seeing kind of that pattern play out, like the distribution model from the Wyckoff pattern. Uh, I don't necessarily think that this is going to be sustainable. You know, obviously when it gets max red and you see it across the board and things are above one, I mean, look at XRP, it's 0 0.05. It's a big move. Uh, 0.045 for Doge. People are still playing around with Doge. It's hilarious. Litecoin 0 0.05. Things that shouldn't be up there definitely are up there. It's really interesting to see that. Um, I just want to pull one last thing before we go off the show today, and that's just the alt market because I think there is also a case that alts could rally here too. I know Bitcoin dominance is up at 54.03 right now, which is really good. Um, obviously, if Bitcoin pulls back in any way, there is the possibility that alts could rally here. Uh, we're already seeing some alts do fairly well. AVEX, like you and I were talking about before the show, it's about it's about forty. It is above forty right now. You know, links at twenty point twenty dollars and sixty cents. Um, you know, there's plenty of room. Solana's for back, you know, around one ten. Exactly. Yeah, Solana's doing well too here. Um, I think it's possible. I'm not convinced it happens though. That, that's the only thing I will say. Like the setup is there for for a squeeze and alts if the funding rates get that way after bitcoin dumps
but it, there's also the case that everything just kind of sells off too, right? So you kind of have to weigh that. I am more on the side of not playing around in this market because that's a more of a fuck around, find out type of scenario, I think, with alts and Bitcoin, especially with these uh, current levels. The interesting thing too is, uh, you know, Coinbase stock too. We were talking about it last week has a really good run up here, right? The ETFs are also doing extremely well today. ETFs are up, you know, 5% or so. This is a really good move to the upside, but you can see how overbought it is on the daily. We have earnings this week for Coinbase. Now, the question is, if this distribution model does work out and Coinbase has not the greatest earnings, or maybe their outlook isn't as great going forward, again, I, I don't necessarily know if that's going to be the case. Coinbase has obviously got to be doing pretty well given what's happened with the ETF. But I think that there is a good chance that we could see a major dump and I mean this to the point where we break through the 50 moving average, we probably test somewhere around the 200 moving average, which would be down here. And if that's the case in the coming days or weeks, then we get another C wave to push us up, but it's not enough to go above the A wave. You have an irregular flat correction, and that pretty much tells us that we're going to see uh, further continuation to the downside for Coinbase. So that would also line up with you know Bitcoin possibly being in distribution uh, mode right here and selling off. So it's really interesting right now in the crypto market. It was boring there for about three weeks or so but it's starting to pick up and i think we should get excited and start watching the charts a lot more now we'll cover more on the show too but uh i am not convinced that we are in a bull market for crypto prices are up great amazing but the thing is a lot of people won't sell because they know that the prices are up and they think that it'll, they'll continue going up forever let me not uh just to remind you the bank term funding program ends the 11th we know that there is going to be zero money in the reverse repo at some point in the next two months we're getting close to a point where there's just rates are high. There's no credit in the system. There's no one that's going to hold up a lot of this capital. So I would definitely just be cautious and have plans. You know, make sure you have your stop limits. If the price keeps going up, raise your stop limits. Isn't a bad idea to make sure that you secure some of those profits. Yeah, no one ever went broke taking profits. Okay, no. that's how we're going to wrap it up for today's show. Appreciate everyone who joined us. If you've not yet hit that like button, subscribe, drop a comment. Any of that stuff is appreciated. We'll be back tomorrow, talk through CPI data, any earnings, any big news that's happened that's affecting the market. So join us then. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.